Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another week, another episode, and um, it's the 5th of May. As of yesterday, May the 4th, be with you. For all you Star Wars geeks out there like myself, you uh, should understand that reference. But now we are on the Revenge of the 5th. But we're going to leave the Star Wars references down for now because we uh, have another uh, episode, the fifth episode in our series on why we got here, understanding the Middle East. Before we get into the series, we are going to set the tone with today's Prager University segment, which is, Why Isn't Communism as Hated as Nazism? Here's Dennis When Prager. people describe particularly evil individuals or regimes, why is it that they use the terms Nazi or fascist, but almost never communist? Given the unparalleled amount of human suffering communists have caused, why is communist so much less a term of revulsion than Nazi? Communists killed 70 million people in China, more than 20 million people in the Soviet Union, not including about 5 million Ukrainians, and almost one out of every three Cambodians. And communists enslaved entire nations in Russia, Vietnam, China, Eastern Europe, North Korea, Cuba, and much of Central Asia. They ruined the lives of well over a billion people. So why doesn't communism have the same terrible reputation as Nazism? Reason number one, there is, simply put, widespread ignorance of the communist record. Whereas both right and left loathe Nazism and teach its evil history, the left, and I'm talking about the left, not traditional liberals, like Harry Truman or John F. Kennedy, has never loathed communism. And since the left dominates academia, almost no one teaches communism's evil history. Reason number two, the Nazis carried out the Holocaust. Nothing matches the Holocaust for pure evil. The rounding up of virtually every Jewish man, woman, child, and baby on the European continent and sending them to die is unprecedented and unparalleled. The communists killed far more people than the Nazis, but never matched the Holocaust in the systemization of genocide. The uniqueness of the Holocaust and the enormous attention rightly paid to it have helped ensure that Nazism has a worse name than communism. Reason number three. Communism is based on nice-sounding theories. Nazism isn't. It's based on heinous-sounding theories. Intellectuals in general, including, of course, the intellectuals who write history, are seduced by words, so much so that they deem actions as less significant than words. For that reason, they haven't focused nearly as much attention on the horrific actions of communists as they have on the horrific actions of the Nazis. They dismiss the evils of communists as perversions of true communism but they regard Nazi atrocities, correctly, as the logical and inevitable results of Nazism. Reason number four. Germans have thoroughly exposed the evils of Nazism, have taken responsibility for them, and have attempted to atone for them. Russians have not done anything similar regarding Lenin's or Stalin's horrors. To the contrary, Lenin, the father of Soviet communism, is still widely venerated in Russia. And as regards Stalin, as University of London Russian historian Donald Rayfield puts it, quote, people still deny, by assertion or implication, Stalin's Holocaust, unquote. Even less so as China exposed the greatest mass murderer and enslaver of them all, Mao Zedong. Mao remains revered in China. Every Chinese currency note has his picture on it until Russia and China and Vietnam and Cuba and North Korea acknowledge the evils their countries committed under communism, communism's evils will remain less known than the evils of the German state under Hitler. Reason number five, communists murdered mostly their own people. The Nazis, on the other hand, killed very few fellow Germans. World opinion, that largely meaningless and amoral term, deems the murder of members of one's own group far less noteworthy than the murder of outsiders. That's why, for example, blacks killing millions of fellow blacks in Africa elicits almost no attention from world opinion. And reason number six. 
In the view of the left, the last good war was World War II, the war against German Nazism and Japanese fascism. The left does not regard wars against communist regimes as good wars. For example, the American war against Vietnamese communism is regarded as immoral, and the war against Korean communism and its Chinese communist backers is simply ignored. Until the left and all the institutions influenced by the left acknowledge how evil communism has been, we will continue to live in a morally confused world. In the meantime, all good people owe it to the victims of communism to learn what happened to them. Even worse than being murdered or enslaved is a world that doesn't even know that you were. I'm Dennis Prager. And I want to encourage you to take a moment of your time, not during this show, after the show is fine, to go to PragerU.com. Check them out. See what they've got. They've got a lot of great material. And so I just want to give my, my hats off to uh, Dennis Prager for a job well done for all of the Prager University series videos that he puts out and that we've been able to borrow. Uh, I mentioned just before we did our Prager University segment, but this is the middle of a series. And I've said in the last couple of weeks, I don't even know how long the series is going to run. We just keep running with it week to week. And we have like the next installment, next installment, next installment. And eventually we'll get through the material. So right now we are in week five. Let's take a look at week, uh, part one through f parts one through four. Part one, April 7th, we covered the Kurdish independence movement from 1975. American hostage crisis in Iran from 79 to 81. The Iran-Iraq War, 80-88. Iraq evades Kuwait, August 2nd, 1990. Part two, a week later, April, 7, April 14th, 2017. Iraq invades Kuwait, Operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and Operations Desert Fox, Desert Thunder. Clinton administration pushing the Iraq Liberation Act, which changed the scope of U.S. foreign policy. And we ended that segment on September 11th and the beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom. Part three, April 21st, was September 11th attack, Osama bin Laden's list of demands, the fighting in the caves of Tora Bora, and rare earth elements that were discovered in Afghanistan. And then last week's part four, and yes, I realize part four is boring, but it's important. We covered the creation of Afghanistan from 1747, the Russian-UK great game in Afghanistan, and how that created the Durand Line, which is the uh, Afghan-Pakistani border, which is one of the most dangerous borders in the entire world. Uh, then we also covered the formation of the Emirate of Afghanistan and the Kingdom of Afghanistan, as well as some of the rulers, leading up to the Tsar Revolution, April 27th to 28th of 1978. And that's actually where we're picking up this episode. Um, the thing with the Tsar Revolution, and just to recap, and don't forget, all of our episodes of this series, all of our episodes, period, are all on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash northstaroasis. Look in, click in the video links, and you can see all of the stuff that we've put together week after week. We've got a, in the last two and a half years that we've been doing this show, we've got a lot of great material that we have put your way. And we've taken a lot of complex things in world events and even domestic events and boil them down into what I hope are terms that people can understand. We, we weed out a lot of the noise and leave the, um, and leave you with the meat. So with that, the Saar Revolution, it overthrew the government of President Mohammed uh, Daoud Khan who had taken over from King Mohammed Zaire in 1973. Uh, King Zaheer, he was in power from 1933, I believe, uh, all the way up to 1973. And it was the PDPA, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, which was aligned with the communists, uh, the Soviet Union, that had done the 1973, um, yeah, the 73 overthrow. And then by 1978, there were two factions of the PDPA, uh, the Parsham and the Kalki. Uh, I'm going to try, try to just breeze through names, dates, and places. A lot of this, there's not a test. You don't have to worry about that part. But it, it is important to just understand who some of these people are. Uh, I'm going to try not to let your eyes glaze over here. 
But uh, Mir Akbar Khyber was an active member of the Parsham, and he was murdered on April 17, 1978. Um, Nur Muhammad uh, Taraki of the PDPA had blamed the Dowd government, and it was during the funeral of Khyber that Babrak Karmal and other PDPA leaders were arrested. So this is April of 1978. Uh, another PDPA leader was uh, Hafizuli uh, Amin, and he was placed under house arrest. He, Amin was not arrested, but just confined to home. He, Amin, had instructed the Kelki army officers to overthrow Daud's government. And that is actually what happened uh, a week later on April 27th, 28th, 1978. And Muhammad Daud Khan was out, and here is where we had uh, Nur Muhammad Taki who came in. Now, uh, Taraki was the prime minister, and he was a Kelki. Uh, Karmal, uh, Babrak Karmal, he was the deputy prime minister, and he was a Parshami. And Amin, the foreign minister, was another Kelki. So we have two factions here, and we have the prime minister and the foreign minister, both with one faction, and we have the deputy prime minister with another faction. Um, and so we're going to show you right now the, what we left last week was after uh, Muhammad Daud Khan was overthrown in the Saar Revolution and... Uh, President, well, Prime Minister uh, Taraki holds a press conference. Uh, we're going to show you that press conference once again. Tanks loyal to young communist army officers now guard the palace where President Daud, the last of the Afghan royal family, ruled. Inside, he and his family, including his young grandchildren, were shot dead when his palace guard lost their courageous battle to defend him. The government claims they had to shoot them because they refused to surrender. Men from the different tribes who live in this backward country swarm all over tanks knocked out in the battle. They seem pleased to see the end of the old feudal regime. In the Prime Minister's house, the government has been locked in almost continuous meetings, trying to evolve a policy to bring this near medieval civilization into the 20th century. It was 10 days before the new president, Noor Mohammed Taraki, first appeared in public. Our relationship, you all should be attentively here. Our relationship with all the countries, including Soviet Union, and all our neighbors and throughout the world will be based and depend on the amount of their support to our revolutionary government in political, economical field. Does this mean, Mr. President, that you will be following the strict policy of non-alignment? This is quite correct. He told the press that his government wasn't communist. Afghans are very devout Muslims. To them, communism is a godless heresy. So President Taraki can't afford to risk upsetting their religious feelings by describing his party as communist. The other problem the new government faces is that Afghans are fiercely proud of their beautiful mountainous country. When Britain ruled India, the Afghans fought two bitter wars to keep them out of here. And they're not going to hand over their independence now to any government which looks like surrendering to Russia. Mark Tully in Kabul. Now, the PDPA under uh, Taraki, they, had a they were ones who had advocated for women's rights. They had declared that Afghanistan had equality of the sexes. That's what they wanted, equality. Where have we heard that before? The PDPA was largely under uh, the Taraki regime. They were aligned with the Soviet government. This was opposed by more of the hardline Islamic leaders. They did not want the equality of the sexes. They wanted things the way they were. They didn't even want the Soviet Union to interfere with Afghani affairs. So that led to some conflict within the country of Afghanistan. But there was one other important thing 
that people fail to mention when discussing this period of time. Not that a lot of people discuss this period of time. The PDA, PDPA had also prohibited usury. Now, that, you know, in, in Afghanistan culture, the peasant farmers had to find a way to obtain credit. Kind of like with the farm crisis as we've had here in the United States and how it's impacted Minnesota. Even in a traditional and exploitive credit system, peasant farmers needed money to get the crops to plant and to harvest. And yet, with the pro prohibition, the Soviet-style prohibition of usury, that system collapsed and it had led to an agricultural crisis. And when the peasants start feeling the pinch, and we see this going on in Afghanistan right now where people are going through trash because they don't have enough food because the stores don't have food and there's no job base. And when people are hungry, they turn to desperate measures. The agricultural crisis in Afghanistan, uh, I guess I'll uh, re read a s statement here. It was criticized as a as confiscating land in a haphazard manner that enraged everyone, benefited no one, and reduced food production. It was the first instance of organized nationwide repression in Afghanistan's modern history. That's what the food crisis led to. The Saar Revolution and the land reform gave birth to the Mujahideen and they served as a resistance first against the PDPA. They were trying to protect at the village level their people. That was the purpose of the Mujahideen. And it was from there that other things started to happen. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Tereki was pro-Soviet. So Soviet-Afghan relations during that Taraki regime were normal. Uh, but then we ended up having a series of events that unfolded. Um, February 14th, 1979, and this involved the United States, the U.S. Ambassador Adolf Dubbs, he was kidnapped and then he was killed during the rescue attempt in uh, Kabul. So the United States had icy relations in Afghanistan and it really, really strained. But then we started getting some internal conflict and some purges and ultimately Taraki and his foreign minister Amin were in a big turf battle. By September 11th, 1979, so just a few months after uh, Dubs was murdered and the U.S. kept a low profile, we had Taraki had tried to remove his foreign minister from office. So Taraki went after Amin and three days later, September 14th, 1979, Amin's followers had deposed Taraki and installed Amin as the president. And Taraki was executed two weeks later. He was smothered by pillows. Um, that was the end of that regime. It was a short-lived time for Taraki. Now we get Amin coming in, and Amin was not exactly happy with the way things were going with the Soviet Union. He is the one who did not want to rely so heavily on the Soviets, and Amin was the one who started relying more on the United States, even though the U.S. officially was keeping a low profile. And Amin was also one who was trying to improve ties with Pakistan. And keep in mind the Durand Line is the border between the two countries. And this caused some grave concern within the Politburo in Moscow. Uh, the Soviet Politburo had created a special commission on Afghanistan. Uh, some well-known names in international affairs from the 1980s uh, actually were part of this. Uh, Yuri Andropov, he was the KGB chairman. He later became the premier of the Soviet Union, the general secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR. Uh, we had Dmitry Ustinov, the defense minister, Andrei Gromyko, the minister of foreign affairs, uh, Boris Ponomarov, he was the International Department of the Central Committee chairman, 
And according to then Premier Leonid Brezhnev, events developed so swiftly in Afghanistan that essentially there was little opportunity to somehow interfere in them. Right now our mission is to determine our further actions so as to preserve our position in Afghanistan and to secure our influence there. That was what Leonid Brezhnev had to say. Uh, Amin was invited to Moscow by Alexander Puzanov, the Soviet ambassador to Afghanistan, and then Amin later, shortly afterwards, uh, began a smear campaign against uh, Puzanov, and that deteriorated things even further. And so that forced the Soviets, under the leadership of uh, KGB Chairman Yuri Andropov, to create Operation Storm 333 plans. Essentially, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Babrik uh, Karmal, he was the one that the Soviets curried favor with, and he was the one who was going to be installed as the new head of the Afghanistan government. So when Operation Storm 333 took effect December 27th, 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Let's take a look at how that war started in 1979. One of the most effective and swift Russian military operations is being marked today. 30 years ago, Soviet commando units successfully stormed the presidential palace in Afghanistan's capital. The success allowed the Soviet government to topple the Afghan leader, but didn't prevent the two countries from fighting a long and bloody war. Today, 30 years ago, under the cover of dark, a convoy of tanks slowly started making its way up this mountain pass. Inside were Russian special forces and the future of the Afghan leadership. It wasn't long before they came under fire. Three days earlier, more than 5,000 Soviet troops had been airlifted into the country. Telecommunication links were cut. The capital was isolated. Aware of imminent danger, President Hafizullah Amin moved his officers to the Darul Aman Palace. He thought he'd be safe there. But on December the 27th, three Soviet battalions slowly started advancing towards it. Operation Storm 333 had begun and Zenith and Alpha commandos would later remember it as one of their most successful. The operation lasted just 43 minutes. In each vehicle we had four to five Alpha officers, then the crew of the vehicle, the commander, the driver and the gunner, and in addition to that we had Afghans riding with us. In my car we had the future Afghan defense minister. I assigned one of my men to look after him. I told him, guard this man with your life. No matter what happens, he must stay alive. Dressed in Afghan army uniform, Muslim battalion members looked and sounded like locals. The battalion consisted of citizens from the Soviet Central Asian republics. Their task was to provide cover for the forces involved in the assault on the palace. KGB reports at the time accused Amin of getting rid of opponents, pretending to be loyal to Moscow, and seeking partnerships with Pakistan and China. Top Soviet leaders suspected he was a CIA spy, and they allegedly had the papers to prove it. Afraid that the new communist regime was about to be toppled, Moscow decided to install a man of their choice. Amin had to go. To understand this massacre, you have to see we were shooting to protect our fighters because the gunfire was terrible. The enemy was shooting from the roof, from the windows, and they were protected by the walls while our fighters were on open ground and could be easily shot down. What I still remember and what impressed me was the number of soldiers defending the palace, the number of our enemies. Balashov was wounded. There were 24 of them up against 300 Afghan palace guards. Two Alpha and three Zenith commanders were killed while as many as 200 Afghan security and military personnel died, including Amin and his son. Meanwhile, the city was abuzz. The radio crackled with news that Amin's palace had been stormed. Mohammed Akbar and other opposition army officers were in hiding. We got information that tonight something will happen. Amin called all of his commanders to this palace as he wanted to be prepared to command all his troops against the Russians. But the Russians had already recruited his cook, who put poison in the food. Amin was still alive when the Russian special troops got to him. Later, when we came here, we couldn't find any of his remains. 
Amin was the third Afghan president to be toppled in just 20 months. But Barack Karmel, supported by the Soviet Union, became president. The Soviet-Afghan war had effectively begun. Paul Islia, RT, Kabul. So here we had the PDPA, which was allied to the Soviet Union, which was controlling things in Afghanistan. Three heads of the PDPA leading Afghanistan toppled in 18 months. And two factions. People couldn't get along within the government. Boy, that sounds familiar, actually. Um, but that's the way it was back then. And then when you have Cold War politics added to it, it becomes a powder keg. What you also had, which wasn't really brought out, was the United States alliance with Pakistan, which began in 1954. And so the United States in the Cold War had actually put in some form of influence in that region to act as a check against the Soviet Union. And then when the Soviet Union continued with trying to, in, in how do I phrase this? They were trying to uh, assert their will within the government in Afghanistan, things were coming to a head. Keep in mind also, 1978, 1979, a few other things were going on, which we discussed in our previous episodes. We had the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini became the head of Iran, and we had Saddam Hussein became the head of Iraq. So we were about to begin the Iran-Iraq war, and here we have the Soviets invading Afghanistan. We're going to take a look at one more video clip of the Soviet Union's invasion that shows more on what happened on that day. The event which shaped the year 1980 began in 1979. Soviet troops had begun to move into Afghanistan at Christmas. Moscow claimed they had been invited but to most people, it was simply an invasion. Along with the invasion, a coup d'etat that installed Babrak Karmal as Afghan president. He was Moscow's man, using Soviet troops along with the Afghan army to impose order. They met fierce resistance. In the mountains, Muslim tribesmen pledged a fight to the death against Karmal's communist regime and the invading superpower that supported it. The tribesmen had always been divided among themselves, but they did unite enough to pose a serious challenge to the Soviets throughout the year. Against primitive rifles, Moscow poured in modern hardware, including tanks and helicopter gunships. They blasted the guerrillas' mountain hideaways, but they didn't stop the resistance. Afghans said poison gas was used, but the claim was largely unproved. There were certainly atrocities on both sides, and the casualty toll was high. The fighting sent thousands of civilians into neighboring Pakistan, but beyond their individual misery, the world outside was desperately worried. Were the Soviets abandoning detente in favor of expansionism? America imposed economic sanctions and put the Arms Limitation Treaty on ice. The outlook was gloomy and didn't brighten much as the year progressed. President Jimmy Carter, after that, had put on an embargo against the Soviet Union, including uh, grain shipments, and the Soviets responded by not sending, well, and also responded by not sending the U.S. Olympic team to Moscow for the 1980 Olympics. And then four years later, when we had the Los Angeles Olympics, the Soviet Union had retaliated by not sending the Soviets to the 1984 Olympic Games. So we have a larger, Afghanistan is now fitting into a larger geopolitical context. So two weeks, well actually one week, uh, January 4th, 1980. So we just began the decade of the 1980s and this is how President Jimmy Carter had responded. Now before we play the clip, I do want to point out the very beginning of this, he discusses what happened in Iran because just two months before, we had 52 American hostages who were, captive, who were taken captive at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. And so he discusses that, and then we get the response on Afghanistan. I come to you this evening to discuss the extremely important 
and rapidly changing circumstances in Southwest Asia. I continue to share with all of you the sense of outrage and impatience because of the kidnapping of innocent American hostages and the holding of them by militant terrorists with the support and the approval of Iranian officials. Our purposes continue to be the protection of the long-range interest of our nation and the safety of the American hostages. We are attempting to secure the release of the Americans through the International Court of Justice, through the United Nations, and through public and private diplomatic efforts. We are determined to achieve this goal. We hope to do so without bloodshed and without any further danger to the lives of our 50 fellow Americans. In these efforts, we continue to have the strong support of the world community. The unity and the common sense of the American people under such trying circumstances are essential to the success of our efforts. Recently, there has been another very serious development which threatens the maintenance of the peace in Southwest Asia. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan, which had hitherto not been an occupied satellite of the Soviet, Soviet Union. 50,000 heavily armed Soviet troops have crossed the border and are now dispersed throughout Afghanistan, attempting to conquer the fiercely independent Muslim people of that country. The Soviets claim falsely that they were invited into Afghanistan to help protect that country from some unnamed outside threat. But the president, who had been the leader of Afghanistan before the Soviet in invasion, was assassinated, along with several members of his family, after the Soviets gained control of the capital city of Kabul. Only several days later was a new puppet leader even brought into Afghanistan by the Soviets. This invasion is an extremely serious threat to peace because of the threat of further Soviet expansion into neighboring countries in Southwest Asia and also because such an aggressive military policy is unsettling to other peoples throughout the world. This is a callous violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. It is a deliberate effort of a powerful atheistic government to subjugate an independent Islamic people. We must recognize the strategic importance of Afghanistan to stability and peace. A Soviet-occupied Afghanistan threatens both Iran and Pakistan and is a stepping stone to possible control over much of the world's oil supplies. The United States wants all nations in the region to be free and to be independent. If the Soviets are encouraged in this invasion by eventual success, and if they maintain their dominance over Afghanistan and then extend their control to adjacent countries, the stable, strategic, and peaceful balance of the entire world will be changed. This would threaten the security of all nations, including, of course, the United States, our allies, and our friends. Now, the U.S.-Soviet grain embargo, big mistake. That cost Jimmy Carter terribly. Many people in Minnesota remember the effects of the U.S. grain embargo on the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had received grain from the United States according to a grain agreement in 1975 between the two countries. That agreement required the United States to send 8 million tons of grain to the Soviets. But do you know where that grain came from? Grain came from Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. What happened in Afghanistan when the Soviet policies uh, against usury occurred? We talked about this about 20 minutes ago. It created a credit crisis and a food problem. 
food shortage in Afghanistan. That same thing that affected that grain embargo only served to put the Soviet Union in a position to getting other grain from other sources like Venezuela and Brazil and most of South America. For us, we were just cut out of the deal, but then our farmers did not have a place to send their product to market. And a lot of people were hurt by that decision. That grain embargo hurt Minnesota farmers. Eventually, in 1981, after President Ronald Reagan took office, the grain embargo was lifted, but the damage had already been done. And that was part of the legacy of Jimmy Carter. He had the best of intentions, but the practical, appli appli practical applicability was that it punished his own people, not the people of the Soviet Union. So continuing on in Afghanistan, here we had the Mujahideen, and now they're no longer fighting the PDPA. They're fighting the Soviets. So Chris Robeson was a reporter in 1986, and he went behind the scenes with, behind the lines with the Mujahideen, and he gave some reports, and let's take a look at one of them right now. Afghanistan, a land encircled by the Soviet Union, Iran, and Pakistan, and through which the armies of Alexander the Great once marched. Invaded in 1979 by 85,000 Russian troops, it has been at war ever since. Here, in the valley of Jegdalek, 30 miles southeast of the capital Kabul, I am encamped with a group of resistance fighters from the Jamiat Islam party, one of several different political and ethnic groups making up the Afghan resistance, or Mujahideen. The cry of Allah or Akbar, God is great, rouses one from sleep every morning. For the Mujahideen, this is a holy war. But the struggle against the non-Muslim invaders is also bound up with tribal feuds, different political parties striving for hegemony, and simple monetary gain from international aid. <laughs> Many Mujahideen are barely teenagers, often only 13 or 14 years old. Those Kalashnikov rifles are their most cherished possessions. Today, they are going to attack a Russian post, and even the deputy commander cleans his own gun. Only the cook has more important duties, preparing the tea. Habibullah, my guide, has spent seven years fighting for Afghanistan's freedom. Like many Mujahideen, he has fought in different provinces, even in Kabul itself. How many Russians have you killed? Sure. Six. One group of Mujahideen now position themselves on a ridge above the post, with the rockets spread out in preparation. Suddenly, six Russian helicopter gunships, or MI-24s, appear. Their indestructibility, except by a direct hit on the cockpit or back propeller, and their awesome firepower has led the Afghans to call them flying tanks. Little wonder the Afghans cannot win the war. However, the arrival of the American Stinger missile and the promise of 600 more next year has now made MI-24s vulnerable. They have barely disappeared when the Mujahideen start the attack. The post received several direct hits. Russian tanks and lorries make for cover and the post begins to retaliate. Don't bother shooting, it's a waste of ammunition, shouts an Afghan. Clouds of black smoke are Russian shrapnel bombs. As the attack continues on relentlessly, 
Some Mujahideen sit down and joke. Their rockets finished. It has not occurred to them to leave Afghanistan. This harsh war-torn land is their home, and the war is their job, from five in the morning to nine o'clock at night. Habibullah's best friend was killed in the attack and buried here at his home in the valley of Jegdalek. So Chris Robson went with the Mujahideen and ended up uh, giving us that footage from 1986. But what was happening in the United States? And where were these people getting these Stinger missiles from? Good question. First of all, Ronald Reagan, uh, who had taken the oath of office on January 20th, 1981, had met with some of the Mujahideen. And let's take a look at this. This is we have with the six from the Afghanistan Freedom Fighters. There's a man here whose wife was killed in front of their two children. Another one who lost his brother in the tunnel on a village in which 105 people were massacred by fire and chemicals. Uh, one of them lost a brother. One is the mayor of that village where that took place. And they're here to try and tell the outside world, the free world, what's really going on in Afghanistan. Just as the so there, uh, there was a lot of influence from Ronald Reagan because he was prosecuting the Cold War. It actually became known as Operation Cyclone, which was where the CIA had done a lot of work in trying to keep the war going against the Soviet Union and try to provoke them into more of a Vietnam-style conflict where they got bogged down just like we had gotten bogged down in Vietnam because the North Vietnamese had Russian assistance, Soviet assistance. So that was going on there. Uh, we also had Charlie Wilson, U.S. Congressman from Texas. Charlie Wilson's War, a film came out in 2007, actually discusses what, you know, how Wilson had gotten involved into pushing for more aid to the Mujahideen. So we're going to take a look a little bit more at Reagan and the Mujahideen uh, in order to try to get more of a context of the United States involvement over there. Just as the Columbia we think represents man's finest aspirations in the field of science and technology, so too does the struggle of the Afghan people represent man's highest aspirations for freedom. Accordingly, I am dedicating on behalf of the American people the March 22nd launch of the Columbia to the people of Afghanistan. But right from the beginning, there was a dangerous, destructive force at the very heart of this project. This was because Reagan's partner in the battle to bring freedom to Afghanistan was Saudi Arabia. The Saudi intelligence agencies worked with the CIA to ship arms and money to the Afghan rebels. On the surface, the Saudis did this because a fellow Muslim country had been invaded by communists. But it was also part of their attempt to export the dangerous fundamentalism at the heart of their own society. In 1979, a group of Saudi radicals had taken over the Grand Mosque in Mecca. For two weeks, the authorities had fought running battles with the insurgents. They discovered that a number of the attackers had been taught by the most senior religious leader in the country. It made the ruling family realize just how fragile their grip on power was. So as well as sending the money and the weapons, they encouraged young radicals to go and fight in Afghanistan. One of them was a young Osama bin Laden. The aim was to divert their anger. But it meant that with the arms would also come the pessimistic and intolerant version of Islam, Wahhabism. To begin with, these ideas would have little influence in Afghanistan. But they would take hold there and mutate 
into a dark and violent force that was completely at odds with Reagan's vision of freedom. At the beginning, though, no one knew who to give the weapons to, and an odd group of adventurers went into Afghanistan to find out. One of the first was a Texan socialite called Joanne Herring. When I went into Afghanistan, I don't even know how I got in. The president of Pakistan flew me to the border, you know, the no man's land that, that the British created very wisely between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we boarded a truck. I put on men's clothing, and we got on this truck and went somewhere. And we went into these camps, and there would be these men with beards and turbans and in rags, really. They had nothing. And there, with their 1918 infield rifles, and they would stand there and they'd say, to the last drop of blood. And your heart would just burst. But I thought, oh, what will they do with an unveiled woman coming in here? And I thought, you know, they, they really may kill me because they might not understand why I'm here. But they did. They were so grateful, so grateful. They, they said, the world doesn't know. Thank you for coming. My heart was given immediately to these people who believe so much in their God, and I think it's the same God as I worship, just in another way. And they would come back, and of course, completely exhausted and almost dead, and those who were still alive, and then this new group would say, I can't wait to go out and kill Russians. The person you just seen interviewed there, Joanne Herring, she was really the big influencer. She uh, was from Houston and uh, had, you know, married influential people. Actually, James Baker, who was uh, a former U.S. Secretary of State, you know, at the time she was active. Um, they were childhood friends. So she knew people of influence. The Pakistani president she knew from the early 70s, uh, back when he was you know, with the Pakistani army. And as he rose in power, I mean, he, she had very important uh, political and friendship relationship with people in Pakistan. And from that, she was able to, as a Republican uh, socialite, able to lean on a Democrat congressman, Charlie Wilson, to lobby to get more support for the Mujahid. See, I can't even pronounce that word. <laughs> Mujahideen. I'm sorry, folks. I'm, I'm so tongue-tied today that uh, <laughs> I'm just going to laugh. Uh, but anyhow, it was Charlie Wilson who uh, really helped with a... Uh, really helped in getting the support in Afghanistan that they needed and Joanne was the one who got Charlie Wilson aboard and in 2011 she had released a book called Diplomacy and Diamonds uh, My Wars from the Ballroom to the Battlefield and I highly recommend that you read it. I actually read it when it first came out and it is an intriguing read. So then we had uh, prosecuted a proxy war against the Soviets in Afghanistan during those eight years and then, mind you, also uh, 1986, uh, Karmal was, uh, was uh, removed by Mikhail Gorbachev, who had then, uh, by then, uh, become the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. May 4th, 1986, and Karmal was exiled in Moscow. So that was a failure as well. So now, by 1988, it was time for the Soviets to withdraw from Afghanistan and withdraw they did. Without losses, but diplomatic and intelligence sources believe they may soon be forced to delay their retreat. While these troops leave, Western sources say others are being rushed back to reinforce besieged Afghan army strong points. For 14 days, Afghan rebels hammered a government fort at Kalat in southeast Afghanistan until it fell. 
The defeated garrison left behind armored personnel carriers and fuel to use them, in addition to ammunition that the rebels at once put to use. Attacks on this and other strong points are being stepped up as the rebels pour in from Pakistan. They're harassing the departing Soviets and closing off the main lines of communication to the Afghan capital. The U.S. ambassador to Pakistan says the rebels should not be criticized for refusing to give the Soviets safe passage out of the country. Afghan people have been waiting uh, 10 years for, for freedom. I don't think uh, we or anyone else in a position to tell them, uh, well, it's going a little bit too fast. Uh, you shouldn't be getting your freedom back as quickly as you are. But the rebels are heartened by the ease with which they have taken over large areas of the country in the last month. The capture of Kalat was significant. It cut the main highway between the capital and the second largest Afghan city of Kandahar. Now Kandahar itself is in danger of falling. Soviet leader Gorbachev has threatened retaliation if Pakistan continues to aid the rebels, but a rebel victory now seems closer than ever. So in 1988, the Soviets had withdrawn. It was a bloody eight-year affair. And the United States won uh, Operation Cyclone. Unfortunately, it never really solved as many problems as we thought it would. Just opened up some more doors for other problems. Let's take a look at a Soviet veteran and his recollections of the fighting in Afghanistan from back when he was younger. And this is taped in 2009. My name is Igor Yerin. I was drafted into the Soviet Army when I was 20 years old. I was a surgeon in an infantry regiment serving in Afghanistan's Kunduz province for two years, from 1982 to 1984. Right now, I'm a director of a state museum of Afghan war. This museum is my life. It's a history, and I'm a part of this history. We knew that we were needed, that we gave two years of our lives to serve our motherland. Back then, it was the time of communism. There was us over me and the state over person. When you're 20, you don't ask many questions. You just follow orders, especially because you took an oath. It was only the best who were sent to serve abroad, and I was proud to be one of them. It was also an element of curiosity. What is really happening there? And only when you see the war, the injured, destroyed military hardware, only then do you begin to realize that it involves risk. First of all, it was difficult because of the harsh climate conditions. Military service was tough. We were protecting convoys, setting up ambushes, gathering intelligence. My most vivid memory is when I saw my friends blow up on a mine. When I saw what happened, I realized that I was in the middle of a minefield and that not everyone from my platoon would be able to get out alive. It could have been down to just one wrong move. We had losses. Not everyone came home. That's difficult to cope with. I feel deep sorrow when I talk to a mother who lost her only child, and she tells me she will never have grandchildren. It's difficult to think about these things because I served with her son. Time definitely heals, so I no longer feel sadness or pain, but what I do feel is pride. We tried our best to fulfill our task, and it was not to defeat Afghanistan, but to help them. It might have been wrong the way we entered Afghanistan, the way we conducted our affairs, but from today's perspective, everyone who criticized us has ended up in the same predicament. The situation is stalemate, and it will not change. Afghans are very special people. In their mentality, everyone who enters with a weapon is an enemy. For centuries, many countries tried to conquer Afghanistan. In the 20th century, it was Soviet Union's turn. Right now, NATO is there, but the problems are still the same. I would tell a young soldier going into Afghanistan, try not to fire a weapon. When you come home, you start to realize that you followed the orders that sometimes contradicted your personal beliefs. And that's what you have to live with for the rest of your life. And there is no doubt that he is actually right. One of the things that I do try to show on this show, on uh, this program, is how much alike, militarily speaking, and we're still people. 
I've discussed on this show numerous times the battles that I faced with post-traumatic stress disorder. We've covered this periodically throughout the last two and a half years. There's no doubt that in Russia, in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, that they faced the same thing from Afghanistan, some from World War II, and other proxy wars that they've had. As General William Tecumseh Sherman said during the U.S. Civil War, war is hell. War means killing. It doesn't matter if it's the Soviets invading Afghanistan. It doesn't matter if it's the British trying to protect what they had for interests in Afghanistan, as we covered last week, or if it's NATO and the United States in Afghanistan, right there, right now. War is still hell, and war still means killing. So one of the things that my producer and I have talked about, uh, Dallas, is the nature of this show. And one point that we stress is that nobody seems to teach history anymore. It seems like it's forgotten. But that, folks, is the purpose of this show. To show the greater context of the world in which we live in by examining our past so hopefully we don't make those same mistakes. That's why we do this week after week. Our politicians in Washington, Democrat and Republican, they don't know the history. That's really a sad affair. People at the water cooler, they don't know it either. But now, hopefully, in the last two weeks, you understand a little bit more as to what's going on in Afghanistan. And in recognition of the Soviets' attempt at conquering Afghanistan, we're going to leave you with uh, the Red Army Choir and Valeria Kurnyshenka singing Ketchusa. Расцветали яблони и груши, поплыли туманы над рекой. Выходила на берег Катюша, на высокий берег на крутой. Выходила на берег Катюша, на высокий берег на крутой. Выходила, песню заводила, про степно. Песенка девичья, ты лети за ясный солнце вслед. И бойцуя нами подгоничи, от Катюши передай привет. И бойцуя нами подгоничи, от Катюши передай привет. Пусть он вспомнит девушку простую и услышит, как она поет. For Dallas Pearson, producer, and your host, Jeff Williams, you're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you that we have 233 shopping days left in the city. Thanks for watching. See you next week.